Okay, welcome everyone. And thank you for joining us for this webinar about the essential labor and essential lives of migrant agricultural workers. Um, before we begin, I'm just gonna say a few words in Spanish to help our Spanish speaking participants locate the simultaneous translation services. Quisiera mencionar que si prefieren escuchar el seminario en español, deben seleccionar el audio en español dando clic en el botón que dice traducción o interpretación en su pantalla de Zoom. Si eligen utilizar el audio en español, por favor recuerden que hay que silenciar o poner mute el micrófono del panelista que esté hablando. De lo contrario, van a escuchar español y inglés al mismo tiempo. Si no pueden ver el botón de traducción, interpretación, es muy probable que deban actualizar su versión de Zoom. So my name is Susanna Claussen and I'm a PhD candidate at the Institute for Resources, Environment and Sustainability and a research associate with the Center for Sustainable Food Systems at UBC. My research looks at how to create more sustainable and just food systems, focusing on the intersections between farm labor, agroecology and organic certification. As we begin, I would like to acknowledge that UBC's Vancouver campus is situated on the tra traditional, ancestral, and unceded territory of the Musqueam people. Each of you are joining us today from many places, uh, near and far. And I'd also like to acknowledge that the traditional care, I'd also like to acknowledge the traditional caretakers of those lands. I would encourage everyone to just take a moment and situate yourselves in place. On whose territories do you currently reside? How are you accountable to the people of those lands? If you don't know whose territories you're on, we'd encourage you to begin that learning journey by doing some research to find out. One way uh, you can do this is by going to nativeland.ca. I'd also like to invite you to think about the links between historical and ongoing colonization and our conversation today about agricultural labor and racialized migrant farm workers. Today is the fifth installment in our webinar series, Building Resilient Food Systems During COVID-19 and Beyond. This series is brought to you by the Center for Sustainable, for Sustainable Food Systems and, sorry, <laughs> the Center for Sustainable Food Systems and the, the BC Food Web and the Faculty of Land and Food Systems. The Center for Sustainable Food Systems at UBC Farm is a teaching and research center, as well as a local to global food hub working towards a more sustainable food secure future. Our mission is to innovate from field to fork to achieve resilient, thriving and socially just food systems for all. BC Food Web is a web portal pro project which aims to increase access and connection to current research and other resource materials and to encourage innovation between farmers and researchers for future project collaborations. The Faculty of Land and Food Systems is a world leader in integrated research, education and service. The faculty aims to address critical global issues around human health and a sustainable food supply. Today's webinar topic is Essential Labor, Essential Lives, Migrant Agricultural Workers, and COVID-19. Today, we are very fortunate to have Alejandra and Noé, members of Puerto Migrante, Dr. Min Suk Lee, and Dr. Annalise Weiler, who will explore the conditions facing migrant farm workers during COVID-19 and the transformations required to ensure their health, safety, and dignity into the future. After each panelist gives a brief presentation, we will then move on to the question and answer portion of the webinar. If you have questions for the panelists, please navigate to the Q&A tab at the bottom of your Zoom control panel and share them with us there. Also feel free to upvote others' questions by clicking on the thumbs up symbol. If you would like the opportunity to chat with other attendees, please feel free to open the UBC Farms Facebook page where we are streaming on Facebook Live and you can use the comment function there to chat. Lastly, we would also like to just acknowledge that these unprecedented times mean we all have new working conditions. So please just bear with us and our speakers if there are any unexpected distractions or interruptions. So first up, we have Annalise Weiler. Annalise is an assistant professor of sociology at the University of Victoria. Her research focuses on environmental sustainability and equity for workers across the food chain and she actively contributes to groups such as Justice for Migrant Workers and the BC Employment Standards Coalition. Annalise will be creating some context for the role of migrant farm workers in our food chain. 
So I will pass it on to Annalise. Thank you. Great. Thanks so much, Susanna. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen here. All right, and Susanna, could I get a thumbs up from you if things look all good and if you can hear me okay? Okay, wonderful. So I'm gonna jump right in and get us a little bit established on the same page in terms of how Canada's migrant farm worker programs work, just some of the nuts and bolts, and the next panelists will give a little bit more richness and detail to some of the bare bones that I'm gonna put us through. So to begin, how has Canada treated migrant farm workers so far during the pandemic? I'll talk a little bit about the timeline over the past several months. Spoiler alert, Canadian governments have treated racialized migrant farm workers from the global south as though their lives are less valuable than those of Canadian citizens. Next, I'll rewind a little bit and talk about how we got here. So the history of Canada's migrant farm worker programs and really how Canada's migrant farm worker programs create vulnerability by design. So I encourage people to go beyond thinking about individual good employers or individual bad employers, but thinking about the structures of unfreedom, deportability, and exclusion. And I'd invite you as we're going through this webinar to think about how this situation might be unfolding differently if we were talking about 60,000 young, white, able-bodied, middle-class Canadian citizens, and how the category of foreign worker shapes who Canadians think of as us and not us. So rewinding a little bit back to March, which feels like four lifetimes ago, grower organizations were warning of food shortages because of the border closures and saying that there were going to be um, potential food shortages because they weren't able to hire migrant agricultural workers and that there would be delays at hand. So when Canadian government um, heard about this food shortage, they took it pretty seriously. And so they quite quickly lifted travel restrictions on all temporary foreign workers. So that includes caregivers, fish and seafood processing workers, meat packers, and agricultural workers. And they implemented this mandatory 14-day self-isolation and wrote a check for $50 million so that growers could implement this. Meanwhile, activists and researchers were really raising alarm bells at the lack of a coordinated plan to enforce mandatory guidelines that would ensure that workers themselves would be safe. And they warned about outbreaks, particularly in employer-provided migrant worker housing. So researchers have documented that migrant worker housing is often really inconsistent in terms of quality. So it can range from housing that I've seen that is well-equipped, spacious, has good access to technology, all the way to crowd, overcrowded, dilapidated, and rodent-infested housing. And as it happens, we're now learning that there was a period of six weeks when the federal government actually just stopped inspecting migrant farm worker housing altogether and later resumed with virtual housing inspections, which seem to have been about as effective as virtual inspections of long-term care facilities. And when we're looking at June, um, so we can see here that the pitting of farm workers against national food security gained new heights of absurdity when an Ontario grower was lamenting the loss of an asparagus crop while seven of his employees were laying in hospital beds. One of those employees later died, and this was a farm that had multiple histories of complaints. And here we are now in July. So in Ontario, over a thousand migrant farm workers have been infected with COVID-19, and the government has told workers who are tested positive but asymptomatic to continue working. There have been continued reports of cramped substandard housing and inadequate food during quarantine. And so in fact, in Windsor, Essex, a major area of outbreak, the Canadian Red Cross has stepped in. So how did we get here? Back in 1966, Canada established a pilot program for the Seasonal Agricultural Worker Program 
with Jamaica. So there are 264 workers who came at that time. Since that time, the program has expanded. There are now multiple streams above and beyond the seasonal agricultural worker program um, and some 54,000 workers in 2018. The workers are coming from all across the globe. And um, employers have the capacity to select workers based on their country of origin as well as their uh, gender. And so this is really a challenge in terms of thinking about over the past century, many of the core aspects of the program have stayed the same. Workers must stay separated from their families for prolonged periods, and they generally don't have access to permanent residency. The majority are men. And so as a result, the pandemic has really exacerbated issues that are already well documented by researchers such as isolation from local supports, um, employers' ability to enforce coercive surveillance and control that extends deep into workers' personal lives. And this has largely been done under the banner of safeguarding public food security for Canadians. But this is also about safeguarding private agri-food capital accumulation. So 65% of migrant farm workers in Canada are employed on farms that generate over $2 million in revenue. Many are working on farms where there are not food crops being produced at all. It's production of tobacco, cannabis, ornamental flowers, and Christmas trees. So food security is ultimately only one part of the picture. And food security cannot be achieved on the backs of people who, are been, who have been made unfree and deportable. So a little bit about how agricultural streams of the temporary foreign worker program create vulnerability. I wanna focus on unfreedom, deportability and exclusions. So workers do not get to freely choose where they work, for whom, or the length of their contract. If they encounter a bad employment or housing situation, as in this housing depicted in Kelowna, changing employers is often extremely difficult or unfeasible. If a worker fails to meet employers' expectations or if they sustain an illness or injury on the job, they know they can be repatriated. Um, so these two workers were based in West Kelowna during the pandemic, Erika and Jesus, and after they had undergone the 14-day isolation, so they were not positive for COVID-19, they'd undergone the isolation, they had two local friends who visited and brought some clothing and culturally appropriate food. But as a result of the employer saying, you have violated the no visitor policy, both Erika and Jesus were repatriated. And so in Erika's words, she said, many employers believe that by giving us work, we belong to them and they can do with us what they want. And finally, Looking at the exclusions agricultural workers face, farm workers are excluded from many of the basic provincial protections that govern other workers, um, such as minimum wage, in some provinces, the ability to join a union. And they also lack practical access to many of the rights that they have in theory. So access to healthcare, workplace safety insurance, the ability to have supports in the events of sexual assault. And some of the changes workers and advocates have really put forward are permanent residency on arrival, proactive enforcement in housing and workplace safety conditions with workers' involvement, and full inclusion in the labor standards that govern other workers. So I'll leave it at there, um, but I look forward to your questions. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Annalise, for that presentation. Um, really demonstrating the ways that the program is designed to make workers vulnerable. So next up, it's my pleasure to introduce Noé and Alejandra from Fuerza Migrante. Noé Barrientos is a temporary foreign worker from Mexico. He worked as a migrant farm worker in the Seasonal Agricultural Workers Program for four seasons. Noé decided to become a member of Fuerza Migrante to support other migrant workers in their struggle for justice in Canada and has been doing this work since 2018. 
Alejandra Henao is originally from Colombia and has supported migrant workers in BC and from across Canada as staff of the Surrey Support Centre of the Agricultural Workers Alliance in Surrey, BC from 2011 to 2013 and then as a volunteer and member of Fuerza Migrante, formerly known as the Migrant Workers Dignity Association from 2014 to present. Gracias por estar con nosotros hoy, Noe Alejandra, and go ahead. No, eh, tú empieza. Ok, Lito, espero que me escuchen. Eh, bueno, algo que tengo que compartir es que al ver muchos uh, artículos recientes sobre acerca de trabajadores migrantes e indocumentados, con citas de defensores políticos, académicos, propietarios de granjas y sus asociaciones, y en los comentarios de miles de canadienses ignorantes y racistas se arrojan odio. Este odio contra los migrantes y los indocumentados es tan normalizado como el vitro lo que pueblos indígenas han soportado durante generaciones. Um, Noé said that he has been seeing and we have been seeing so many news articles recently about migrant workers and undocumented folks. Uh, with many quotes from advocates and politicians, academics and others, uh, including farm, farm owners and farm associations. Um, and the comments to these articles are full of uh, racist hate and ignorance from Canadians, um, a similar hate uh, that is spewed against migrants and undocumented folks, uh, as that uh, vitriol that indigenous folks have had to endure for generations. Y busco culpar a estas personas racializadas por su opresión, al tipo que excusa a la sociedad canadiense por causarla y perpetuarla. Y la solución es que a menudo vemos citada los artículos increíblemente específica como pagarles lo que se les debe o demás o demasiado general, todos deberían tener lo mismo, los mismos derechos que todos los demás, que deberían ser igual. And this hate uh, that we see uh, seeks to blame uh, folks for their own oppression uh, while excusing Canadian society from causing it and perpetuating it. Uh, also, the solutions that we hear all the time, uh, quoted in articles, um, can be incredibly specific, like pay the worker what he sold, uh, or way too general, like workers should have the same rights as everyone else. Y por supuesto, no olvidemos a las manzanas podridas, canadiense promedio, los reporteros de noticias, los funcionarios del gobierno y los mismos jefes que lo adoran. Ford y Trudeau lo han usado innumerables veces desde que comenzó la pandemia. Y manzanas podridas es la nueva palabra favorita de la Embajada de México en Canadá, que se sorprende recientemente al describir que las cosas no están bien en las granjas de Canadá y han logrado seguramente se les verá jadeando y resoplando sobre cómo quieren proteger a los trabajadores migrantes. And of course, we can't forget about uh, the quote unquote bad apples. The average Canadian, uh, news reporters, government officials, even Justin Trudeau, the Prime Minister, and Doug Ford, the, Minister of Inter uh, the Premier of Ontario, have used it many times since the pandemic started. Uh, and bad apples is now the new favorite word of the Canadian or the Mexican Embassy in Canada who was apparently very surprised recently uh, to find out that things are not okay at the farms. And of course, they will have also been making sure that they can be seen publicly, huffing and puffing, about how they want to protect migrant workers. Pero la Red Consular de México en Canadá ha sido durante casi 50 años una fuerza líder en la operación de trabajadores. 
agrícolas, creando un ambiente de miedo, de castigo absoluto para los trabajadores, de impunidad casi total para los empleadores y ha trabajado en complicidad con los funcionarios del gobierno canadiense y agencias como ESDC, Immigration, World Trade BC, etc., que no hacen nada o hacen menos lo menos que pueden hasta que los trabajadores son presionados o obligados a regresar a sus hogares o a menudo aún enfermos, heridos y sin solución a sus problemas. Well, let's remember that Mexico's consulate network in Canada has been for almost 50 years one of the leading forces in the oppression of farm workers. Uh, they have created an environment of almost absolute fear and punishment for the workers and of also almost complete impunity for employers. They have also worked in complicity with Canadian government officials and agencies like ESCC, Immigration, WorkSafe and others. Uh, and these institutions, these Canadian institutions do nothing but do the least they can until the workers are pressured to or forced to go back home, often still sick, injured or having no solution for their problems. Y en nuestras visitas y conversaciones con los trabajadores migrantes en todo el país, escuchamos, nadie nos visita, ustedes fueron los primeros que, que vinieron a hablar con nosotros este año. Alguien vino, pero hablaron con nosotros, no hablaron con nosotros, sino con el jefe, y no sabemos quiénes eran ni qué dicen. And in our visits and conversations with farm workers uh, across BC, uh, we continue to hear the same thing. Nobody has ever come visit us. Uh, you're the first ones who have come this year. Uh, or, yeah, somebody came, but we don't know who they are. They only spoke to the boss, um, and we don't know what they said. Um, so, you know. Ya es hora de que todos dejen de pensar, ver y tratar a los migrantes y a los indocumentados como simples cosas o números o incluso trabajadores. Son personas, son seres humanos a los que se les debe de escuchar, pedirles su consentimiento para todo lo que les afecta y ser inherentemente dignos de respeto. Organizarse para la justicia para los trabajadores migrantes y las personas indocumentadas desde comenzar por preguntarles por qué, cómo y con quién determinan si algunas personas serán marginadas y explotadas de manera sistemática y colectiva mientras que otras se benefician enormemente de su operación. It's about time uh, that everyone stops thinking, seeing, and treating migrant workers and undocumented folks as things, as numbers, and even as workers. Um, they are people, they are human beings who should be listened to, who should be asked for their consent on anything and everything that affects them, and they are inherently worthy of respect. Organizing for justice and migrant workers' rights and undocumented rights um, should begin with questioning why, how, and who determines that some people are to be systematically and collectively exploited and marginalized for the benefit of others from this oppression. Si es bien importante centrarse en las formas específicas de, op de opresión de los migrantes y indocumentados, debemos luchar en múltiples dimensiones, contra el patri patriarcado, la supremacía blanca, la colonización y el capitalismo. Como dice el EZLN, debemos de luchar por todo y para todos. Uh, While well, it's important to focus on specific forms of oppression of migrant workers and undocumented folks, we must also fight in multiple dimensions. Uh, we must fight against the patriarchy, against white supremacy, colonization, capitalism. Like the Zapatistas say, we should be fighting for everything for everyone. Okay, and now um, just to talk about a little bit about what is happening on the ground, I'm just gonna say half of what I have, I have prepared, but so um, uh, migrant workers have faced the same structural racism that First Nations have endured for centuries. The pandemic has not impacted the power structures in Canada, they have rather been more visible and the systems of operation work as good or better than before the pandemic. So no matter how many inspections ESDC has done, how many apologies for the three migrant workers who passed away in Ontario with care from government officials, 
how many guidelines or protective measures for the workers. The reality on the farms haven't really changed that much. Uh, the dominant dynamic hasn't changed. Migrant workers' voices haven't been present in the discussions or measures needed to protect their own lives. The same way that they haven't been able they haven't been able to participate in the negotiation of their own employment contract for more than 50 years now. Uh, on top of this, and all the, Juan Noe explained and analyzed did too, and uh, COVID-19. That has exacerbated the oppressive dynamics between employers and workers and problems in the temporary foreign worker program. Uh, COVID-19 has become the perfect excuse for employers to control the workers' lives during and after work while not feeling any pressure to uh, provide decent working and living conditions and not facing penalties for breaches of federal COVID-19 related rules. And in the meantime, the federal and provincial governments have left, uh, left employers with the responsibility to comply with labor and health authorities measures without any ac actual accountability. So we've heard migrant workers, um, Migrant, uh, many migrant workers have only received a list of measures to take. Uh, they have to fill out forms and no one at least, uh, there's no one to ask questions like uh, what happens with their contract. They receive, sign it and put it away. Many arrive in Canada without, without un, uh, understanding the quarantine period. If it's time uh, lost from work, wasted time, a missed opportunity to make money and contribute to, uh, to their families or who's gonna pay for it or when. On the other hand, what's happening to my coworker who tested positive, who's feeding them? Are they still alive in there? Should I call someone or just wait to feel better? Are they gonna blame me for feeling sick? Am I gonna be sent back home if I don't feel better soon? What's gonna happen to my family if something happens to me? We, re we, uh, we have also received calls from those in Mexico and Guatemala almost every day saying the offices are closed, they're not answering the phone, are they gonna call me to work? They blocked my file and I don't know why. And my employer requested an LMA, a labor a market impact assessment for me and it was approved, but can I travel? My employer didn't call me this time, what should I do? Can you call them? Can you find me an employer? Um, other workers care very little about the pandemic the new self-isolation measures in Canada, all the restrictions or guidelines that were given to the employers that Annalise uh, explained. Um, they, did, they didn't hear about the 50 million that the federal government offered to support employers in the agricultural sector, 1,500 per worker, uh, to ensure isolation period requirements and cover expenses like hotel accommodations and food uh, for, the, uh, during, uh, for the workers during the quarantine the much less they care or they knew about this 77.5 million uh, emergency fund that the federal government offered food producers to access more personal protective equipment, implement health pro protocols and respond to emergency pressures from uh, COVID-19. Many workers don't understand why Canadians blame them from being, uh, bringing the virus when they have complied with the self-isolation period upon, upon arrival, have been locked in the farms the whole time, haven't been able to go to the bank or the store, or haven't received any visits from friends, church groups, or advocates. In the meantime, they've seen high deductions in their paycheck for food supplies and their delivery, uh, had to deal with people manipulating or charging extra for remittance services, uh, and had to, ch uh, to change and adapt with the food brought for them by the farm. And finally, those workers who have seen an outbreak in their work sites, they wonder why they are uh, to blame when they've seen domestic work, uh, co-workers coming and going to the farm every day, when their symptoms were dismissed by their supervisors and, when, uh, and were called lazy when they had to miss work for being sick. For instance, uh, migrant workers from Scotland, uh, when the outbreak happened and sent uh, 169 workers to self-isolate again. They felt scared, blamed, labeled as dangerous or unruly, abandoned and forgotten. Isolated in total, total control of the employer. And finally, um, uh, we just wanna say that the colonial history of Latin America has involved land expro expropriation and displace, uh, displacement or elimination in many cases of agricultural communities. Europe's uh, massive industrial capital was accumulated through a colonial system of hegemony and that direct domination that terrorized and annihilated 
indigenous peoples, minerals, and other precious resources from Latin America. Still today, we're still being subjugated politically and economically by multinational corporations, including Canadian research extraction companies, social and environmental leaders dedicated to protect the land and water, their own ways of life have always faced judicial persecution, threats, and death. And it's because of these circumstances in the global south that thousands of migrant workers have had to leave their families behind and come to find ways to provide, provide for them, facing substandard working conditions and sometimes death. While this labor force has, has become dependent on the wages offered by the temporary foreign workers uh, in different countries in the world, the food system in Canada has become dependent on the exploitation of thousands of migrant workers. Organizing initiatives as no SS uh, needs to be rooted in questions of who benefits from the, these temporary foreign workers, from the controlled migration that avoids these workers to become permanent residents, from the systematic exploitative characteristics of these programs, from the system of operations that produce and reproduce the labor practices and migration rules that avoid these workers to come with their families, from excluding these workers of treatment as equals with respect and dignity, and from rejecting these workers their humanity to speak up and determine their lives as workers in Canada. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing all of that. I just want to acknowledge that a lot of what was just shared and, and what Annalise was alluding to as well is really a matter of life and death for real people. And, and I just want to thank you so much for all your work on the ground. And it obviously has informed uh, the really incredible astute analysis that you just presented to us um, of the intersecting structures of white supremacy, colonialism, and patriarchy and how they directly impact the lives of migrant workers. So thank you so much. Um, finally, I'm thrilled to introduce Min Suk Lee. Min Suk has directed numerous critically acclaimed feature documentaries. Lee's most recent feature, Migrant Dreams, tells the undertold story of migrant workers struggling against Canada's temporary foreign worker program that treats foreign workers as modern day indentured laborers. Lee is an associate professor at OCAD University, where her area of research and practice focuses on the critical intersections of art and social change in labor, border politics, migration, and social justice movements. So we're very glad to have you here, Min Sook, to, um, to be the last presenter. And please go ahead. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. I want to thank Noe. Thank you to Fuerza. Thank you to Alexandra for setting the context of the program and uh, setting the context of what workers' experiences are like in the program. Um, but also, uh, particularly Noe uh, and other migrant workers who speak out, thank you so much for the courage to do so to speak out and to resist in a program that is designed to shut you down, that is designed to silence you, and that is designed to um, dehumanize uh, migrant farm workers, migrant workers, and people who are in Canada who don't have status. And it's a single piece of paper that is dividing um, migrant workers, migrant farm workers, uh, temporary foreign workers, and people who are uh, without documentation, the set of rights that they have, and then the rights that uh, people who have Canadian uh, citizenship can enjoy. And that single piece of paper uh, creates a labor apartheid in Canada. I often think about Canada's migrant worker program as unfree labor on stolen land. It is very much part of an ongoing colonial project that has been uninterrupted since the 1800s when Chinese workers were brought into Canada under the um, program then, that was the temporary foreign worker program then to build railroads. So this is an ongoing project in Canada. It's not a new story. And it really does reveal the ugly face of Canada to Canadians, which is why it's been so challenging until now, I think recently, um, because of the pandemic, because of the extreme gross abuse and violations of human rights and labor rights, uh, in the context of a pandemic, Canadians and Canadian mainstream media and politicians are finally paying attention to the reality of what migrant farm workers, what temporary foreign workers, and also workers who are undocumented face in Canada. I think for the first time in my entire life, I heard the uh, Prime Minister of Canada speak about migrant worker rights and speak about a kind of justice that they hope to achieve in one sentence. I've never seen that before. I've never heard that before. And you know, if someone had asked me, how do you think migrant workers would be treated in Canada during a pandemic? 
I would have said that what we're being, what we are witnessing, what we are seeing is exactly consistent with how migrant workers are treated in Canada before the pandemic. We have to understand that this program is designed for maximum profit, maximum control of workers' bodies, rights, and freedoms. The fundamental feature of the program is that workers are tied to one employer. They are indentured. Work the program is designed to silence workers. So when we hear about the egregious abuse, the violence that workers face in the work site, that is not an accident. That is exactly how the program is meant to work. Any abuse you hear about, any um, of the kinds of stories that uh, Canadians are now reading in the news, oftentimes these stories were hidden and these stories were silenced also in mainstream media. And migrant workers have been resisting in decades now. And it's workers who have participated in my documents, but who have also spoken out in community organizations, who have organized work stoppages on farms and in greenhouses, who have insisted on their humanity in the face of an inhumane system. And that, I think, is what we need to recognize um, what is very important in changing the status quo. We need to start normalizing status for migrant workers, status for temporary foreign workers, status for workers, because these workers are workers who are fundamental to what Canada requires to, um, Canada requires to function in terms of its food economies, but also migrant worker rights are fundamental to the values that Canada espouses to hold dear. And I, I think that it's really important that people start understanding that this is a program that is a federal program, but has been largely ignored by the federal government. It's largely employer driven. So employers have an incentive, and that's embedded into the program, to treat workers as though they are just work units. Workers have died on farms. Sheldon McKenzie died in 2017 while I was making migrant dreams. He was a Jamaican farm worker. There was an accident, he was, put in, he was in the hospital, and the consulate worker came and tried to send him back to Jamaica so that the expenses, uh, the, the, the claims for the um, medical services would not be a burden on the Canadian medical system and that they wouldn't have that in their records and in their roles. So Noe, you're absolutely right, and I agree with you, and I have seen it, how consulate officials play a role in ensuring that workers are told, be grateful for being in the program. At one point, and I've heard this with Canadian employers saying to migrant farm workers, you should be grateful to be in the program. This is a form of development aid. The ways in which the kind of perverse logic in which the program is justified has really got to be exposed. But I have to say, you know, in terms of how the federal government has uh, handled or um, responded to the pandemic with regards to migrant workers' rights, the kind of hypocrisy and incompetence is extraordinary and un unbelievable and it's infuriating. You know, we all understand that Canada's food system, Canada's food agribusiness system, would not be able to succeed and reap in the billions of profits without the work of migrant farm workers. That is so obvious that even during a pandemic, the federal government rushed in to change legislation to ensure that migrant farm workers could come into the country. They shut down the borders to refugees, but they made sure there were provisions so that migrant farm workers could come in, but they paid no attention to ensure that the health and safety of migrant farm workers would be taken care of. They paid zero attention and gave billions of dollars, sorry, millions of dollars to employers. The very employers who we know are responsible for decades of abuse of migrant workers. To me, that means what we're seeing now was predictable and it's on the hands of the federal government, the provincial government and the municipal government. And I have to say that the abuse of, in the program takes place in many ways and it's enacted in hierarchies of abuse. And I want to draw attention to the experience of women workers in the program. The, the way in which women are uh, treated in the program, because there are, in terms of the demographics of how many women are in the migrant worker program, it's a small percentage of women. 
but many of them experience sexual abuse in the work site. They experience control of their bodies. If a woman is pregnant, they're sent back home. And the women who are selected to work in Canada as part of the program are selected at home because they're single mothers, because they don't have partners. The sexism is baked into this program. I remember shooting in uh, Leamington in 2015, and there was a woman who was incredibly brave and courageous, and she was a fierce, fierce fighter. She'd been working in a fish plant, and the employer was sexually harassing many, many of the women workers. And she was one who refused to be silent about it. She uh, took the, work, the employer to the criminal courts, and he got off with a slap on the wrist. She took him to the Human Rights Commission and won one of the, one of the largest settlements in uh, Ontario history, actually in Canadian history. The kind of program is largely unspoken about. And I think that uh, when we're looking at the ways in which abuse happens, there are interlocking you know, circumstances. Oftentimes workers will be pitted against each other as well. And what I mean by that is in Leamington, uh, in the greenhouses that I've seen and filmed in, it's really unusual to see workers all from one country in one greenhouse. What you will see is workers who are from Honduras, from Colombia, workers who are from Indonesia, workers from Jamaica. So that the employer will specifically, strategically ensure that the workforce is divided with workers from many different areas in the world. And then they are set to, uh, they are set to compete against each other and uh, workers are then um, oftentimes told, you know, that workforce is working harder and faster and they're better workers than you are. The kind of cruel intentionality of um, increasing the kind of racialism and competitiveness is part of the design of the program as well. And the feature of the program that I think um, we don't often talk about because it's not as um, practiced in the seasonal agricultural worker program in SALT, but is very much prevalent in a reality in the temporary foreign worker program is the role of recruiters, the private recruiters. I often think of Canada's temporary foreign worker program as a kind of a criminal pyramid scheme. And the reason I call it a pyramid scheme is that it's layered and it's stacked and everyone's taking their cut. And it's all built upon one person being able to exploit another person. So the federal government set up the program. Employers make their profit. They hire private recruiters to find the workers to work in the farms. Recruiters charge workers. They charge them fees to actually work in Canada's temporary foreign worker program. Many workers come indebted to private recruiters because they can't afford these fees. And fees can be as high as $14,000 to work in Canada's temporary foreign worker program, working in a fruit or vegetable farm. Private recruiters are not licensed. They're not monitored in Ontario and most of Canada. And they are taking a cut from workers. It very much looks like a human trafficking scheme where a worker will arrive in the airport, the private recruiter will pick up workers drive them to a home that's rented where, you know, there could be 20 to 30 workers in, you know, three bedroom house, and then drive the worker to um, the farm to work the next day. And all of their movements are monitored and controlled from then on in Canada. So the role of private recruiters is something that many Canadians are unaware of and need to understand that there is a pecking order of exploitation that is happening, happening in Canada's migrant worker program and everybody is taking their cut and feasting on the labors of migrant workers. And then finally, I just want to say that Canada's migrant worker program functions very much like an exclusion act. We used to have the Chinese Exclusion Act, which was set to ensure that um, Chinese workers uh, and Chinese people did not come into Canada, which was set to ensure a racial purity, the white supremacy of Canada. We don't have that anymore. But fundamentally, you have to ask yourself, why is there a migrant farm worker program that's a temporary farm worker program? Why are workers manufactured as temporary when it's clear the work is essential, the labor is required year round, when it's clear that workers in the farm worker program 
And in many of the other sectors that uh, the temporary foreign worker program brings workers in are essential to Canada's economy. The, the temporary foreign worker program is engineered to ensure that workers from the global south do not secure status. It functions as a kind of immigration barrier to control immigration to Canada. And the relationship between the temporary foreign worker program and Canada's immigration pathways is something that needs to be understood because it functions fundamentally to shut out workers of color from the global south. And that needs to be exposed. Finally, I just wanna say that worker resistance has been ongoing. There has been innumerable stories of workers who are being um, abused, who are living in substandard housing, who are being treated as um, you know, second class human beings. Nevertheless, despite all of that, workers continue to fight back, to speak out and insist, not just on their humanity, but on their human rights and their labor rights. And finally did something. Status on arrival is what we must be popularizing, what we must be normalizing, and what we must insist of Canadian politicians. Thank you so much, Min Sook, for, for your final words, final panelist. Uh, and yeah, I guess one of the things that you've underscored really clearly is um, as Canadians, we actually have a, a we all have a responsibility, not just those of us that work with farmers and work with agriculture, uh, but to hold our government accountable. Um, and so I'm just gonna launch right into the first question. And uh, that is, how do you think we as Canadians can help migrant justice proceed and succeed? And I'll just uh, ask if uh, Noe and Alejandra want to take a first answer to this question and then I'll let the other panelists go ahead. I'll start and I know if you want to chip in, you can do it. Um, um, I would say that it was very clear to me or to us when uh, the situation in the scolding happened and the workers were so frustrated of being um in isolation again receiving all the racist comments that it was their fault that and so on um it was very clear to me that they needed to feel that they were supported by canadian society um they were they were not gonna do anything and they didn't do anything um uh, up, um to demand better uh, uh, working conditions and, and living conditions because they felt alone, right? So what is happening on the farms for, what is, has been happening for more than 50 years now is because it's happening in isolation and it's like kind of a, like an invisible world, right? So nobody knows what is happening on the farms. So if you really wanna um, feel that you're contributing to the fight, uh, the struggle of migrant workers, come and show them your support. So they feel uh, with someone backing up, their struggle and they're gonna feel more um strength to push for uh for their rights and, and and justice to to their working conditions and living conditions and that would be my piece um i don't know if no one wants to add anything no? no he doesn't okay. i can't see him sorry oh, Lo que yo quiero decir es, es eh, el trabajo aquí en Canadá en las granjas es muy importante y bueno lo, lo importante es de que tanto se valore el trabajo como los trabajadores migrantes como yo y como muchos como miles que todos los años vienen que se valore tanto desde principios hasta fin que se igual que se dé las condiciones para que todos salgamos beneficiados al mismo tiempo y que bueno que esto sirva esta situación de la pandemia sirva para ver un poco más y hacer algo un poco más que podamos ayudar principalmente a los migrantes que somos más vulnerables en estos momentos gracias 
I'm sorry, I think that I lost a bit of what Noe said, but uh, he, he started saying that uh, the work on the farm is very important. The, what they're doing is very important and needs to be visibilized. Uh, y Noe, y me perdí la segunda parte. Dijiste que era muy importante y que más. <laughs> bueno. And needs to be like uh, receive the value and uh, from the Canadian society because I think that they feel uh, stigmatized and away and isolated from the Canadian society and they need to feel part of of the society and need to be uh, that uh, they need they need to be to see that they're valued by the by the Canadian society and I'm sorry that if I missed any other. Thank you. Uh, Min Sok or Annalise, would you like to jump into that question? How do you think we as Canadians can help migrant justice proceed and succeed? Sure, I can jump in on that. Um, so I'd encourage people to look for organizations within your region that are already doing amazing migrant justice work, particularly those that are led by workers themselves. Um, and really, power concedes nothing without demand. And I think this is a great time to engage through political channels, figure out who your MLA, your MPP, your MP is, and ask them what they are doing to address the human rights crises that are happening right now in Canada. So if you can engage locally and think about it on a provincial and a federal level, um, that's certainly one way a lot of migrant justice groups operate beyond political channels as well. Um, so thinking about different modes of putting pressure and generating political will, broadly speaking. I, I think that um, we need to break the silence and we need to break this idea that um, denying essential workers who are fundamentally subsidizing our food economies, our agribusiness economies and industries, that denying them labor and human rights is acceptable. Oftentimes when people talked about migrant farm workers in Canada, they uh, are then answered with, you know, well, um, at least the workers are being, are making more money than what they would make back home. And I used to hear that a lot when I, when I started making, um, you know, I used to hear that a lot. Oh, they work really hard here, but they go back home and they live like kings. And that's a, that's a total lie. The amount of money that workers make here um, is supporting families back home. But oftentimes it's just enough to support the families back home so that they are continually tied to coming back here. Right. So there's no, the idea that somehow workers are living with riches back home. Let's just like dispel that myth. The more we talk about what it's like for workers in Canadian farms, I think the more people become aware that we have a temporary foreign worker program that's manufactured the term temporary. That's a manufactured term. Workers are not temporary. They are permanently required, permanently needed. There's a labor shortage in Canada, fun, frankly across the regions of Canada, we know there's a labor shortage and there has always been in immigration, which is also known as the kind of, you know, uh, way in which settlement is managed, was very much in conversation with Canada's American Worker Program. So I think breaking the silence, and it's taken a while for us to even get to this position and this point, when civil society is having a conversation about migrant worker rights. You know, 20 years ago, when El Contrato, which was the first documentary I made in 2001, when we tried to release that, the growers launched a libel lawsuit against myself and the National Film Board. So they succeeded in ensuring that that film did not circulate. So there was a lot of muzzling and censoring and shutting, silencing, not just of migrant workers, but certainly of anyone who was gonna talk about what's going on in our own backyard. We do have a unique opportunity right now. Annalise is right. We have a narrow window of, um, I guess you could say, you know, the Overton window of political change has been cracked wide open because of the circumstances of the pandemic. So why should we be calling for reformist, you know, um, little reformist changes, which we know fundamentally do not change a program that's irredeemable? 
now's the time when we can reimagine you know how we build Canada and ask some really hard questions. What is the function of the temporary foreign worker program? What's it designed to do? Ensure that there's unfree workers who are constantly available for employers to subsidize the profit billions of dollars for an industry. Is that acceptable as a feature of Canada's um, labor economy? Thank you so much. So Unfortunately, we are um, pretty much out of time, so I'm going to wrap us up now. Um, I'm sorry we only got to one question, but it, all of your answers were super rich and your presentations were also uh, full of detail and really good analysis. So I know there are uh, a lot of unanswered questions in the chat. We will try to answer these after today's webinar and we will be sending more information about where to find this follow-up conversation uh, in an email after the webinar. So we're committed to, to continuing this conversation. I'd really like to express my gratitude to the presenters, um, Noe Barrientos, Alejandra Henao, Annalise Weiler, and Min Suk Lee for sharing their experience and knowledge about this topic in what is really a, a very critical moment for migrant workers globally. Um, and so really paying attention to some of these ideas of how you can support migrant workers and justice in, in your own communities is it's very timely. Behind the scenes, we would also like to thank Jessica Lattice, Kate Hodgson, Michael Saloum, um, and Marie Norton. And we also wanted to mention that if this conversation has inspired you to learn more, we would really encourage you to check out any of the organizations listed on this slide, um, and there are more. They're all doing really critical work to advance justice for migrant communities. So um, yeah, please don't stop your learning journey here. And join us in two weeks for our sixth, sixth webinar, Eating Close to Home, Fostering Local Food Production During COVID-19, uh, which is in two weeks on Thursday, August 6th at 3 p.m. Uh, Pacific. And finally, let us know what you thought about the webinar. You'll be directed to a short survey about this session after the webinar, and we really appreciate your feedback. Um, and feel free to visit us at ubcfarm.ubc.ca. So thank you again for joining us, and we look forward to continuing this important discussion, and thank you to the panelists. <laughs> Bye.